very cold in your side. I rarely see you with storm. I have the door open, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> How is the dogs? I mean, are they happy? Very happy no, here, uh, yeah. We have a little garden so they can run out and in and yeah. Did you talk of the coldest outside? I mean, because I every time know. I saw them it's inside, I mean indoor. I didn't know they really willing to go outside as well. They always want to go out. So he has two very cute shots. <laughs> A good thing now. So how is your trip? I mean, uh, I saw your some of your photo from from the people in. I think they are your supporter. I mean, in your IG, because they just hashtag you know. But I saw you have a lovely line of taste. Um, they are. The, the uh, driving to Scotland is a very long drive, and especially England is a bit boring to drive through. Because uh, yes, because the with dogs you cannot fly, you know. So ah, okay, yeah. But what about the train? Is that allowed? It's an option. We have a TGV to go to Calais, but after in England they don't have any bullet trains. So driving from Folkestone to Edinburgh is about a 12 hours train. Oh. How long does it take? I mean, okay, so you, you still need to go to Leeds to pass through the tunnel. We either take the channel tunnel, which is the longest way to do, uh, but le uh, less risky in winter uh, because of if you have storms or something like that. But the fastest way, which is actually very comfortable is to go to Amsterdam. It's the same distance and catch a ferry boat uh, in the evening, sleep on the boat, and you arrive the next morning in Newcastle, which is only three hours drive from Edinburgh. That's the fastest way to do it. But in winter, I don't do it because sometimes you can, ca you can catch um, storms in the sea and uh, then you have delays and it's very uncomfortable. Yeah. But in summer, it's very nice. Yeah. I, I didn't know you can go in that way. I used to think people must pass through the channel between me and yeah but the ferry boats are still running and especially if you go north it's more practical i we leave for example at um uh, eight nine o'clock in the morning from alsace we arrive in um, amsterdam at uh, 3 p.m it's seven hours drive oh. take the boat that leaves at five o'clock 5 30 and we arrive the next morning at 9 a.m and so you can have a long sleep in the boat and have fun and eat and listen to music and things it, it, it's oh, quite funny. And, and drink wine, yes, <laughs> and <laughs> that's the to drive. And, uh, and then when you arrive at nine o'clock, you, you have three hours drive and you are around lunchtime in Edinburgh, which is very nice, yeah. Oh, I, 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 I didn't know that. I mean, I thought you must stay, I mean, a night somewhere else, maybe in Paris or maybe in Leeds or maybe in... When, when we take the tunnel, when we take the tunnel, um, not because we are a bit older, we don't want to take our time and enjoy. We we sleep at a very good customer uh, called La Grenouillère. It's a two Michelin star restaurant, which is south of Calais. And then we go up and sleep. Yeah. And then we do another stop around Cambridge. So Olivier, you ready? Let's get started, shall we? So I will do a short introduction in Cantonese and after and then English. Okay, hello, we are got me. I have found it. You know, you know, I'm going to say, you know, what's the hour? Grandma, come on, come on, I have some. I have some being out of the bank team. You don't see Amy, you know, 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 you Dai
，最出名，美偶像，佢就装，先到 batch， 诶，咁一个佢哋一九五九年就开始诶成立，然后开始酿酒嘅，咁好多国家族好多代一路喺度有种葡萄啊，有酿酒啦，咁佢哋而家咧有四个光箍同埋六个 single 边一嘅酒，诶，咁佢哋都系同时间都系区内咧做咗一个诶、呃、pioneer， 即系先驱者系做包大咧未，同埋。全法國，全個法國，嗯，咁啊做包大咧未走，咁同埋有好多誒、呃，即係咬沙手嘅 development 啦、啊，誒、呃、promotion 啦、啊，咁誒先攞 batch 個酒莊咧都做好多誒好、呃、多心機去 promote 呢個酒，即係產區嘅酒嘅，咁、嗯、今日誒好高興啦，就邀請到我哋鏡頭另一邊誒嘅嘅先攞 batch 嘅莊主誒、呃、Olivia， 咁佢係係而家嘅莊主啦，咁同時間佢都係全法國。第一個 master 位，係啊，其實重要呢。如果我喺我個酒莊喺有三三嘅時候，我中意投資噶嘛。咁如果我想我個酒莊去 certify 爆蛋咧，其實我仲都係 O E B A 去做著。哦，係啊，所以其實佢即係啲德智體群嘅，或者係偶像，偶像，男神，男神嚟嘅我講笑，全部知道知。OK， welcome back everyone， and let's switch channel to English。Uh, yeah. So welcome to our third episode of our whistling series. So we have been to Mosul in Germany, a classic region for whistling. And last week we have been to uh, also a uh, San Antonio Valley in Chile to taste uh, some whistling from a very special winery. So uh, in this episode we go back to a classic region yes. for Alsace. Yes. So uh, Alsace is also a very famous region. Given that a unique terroir to produce a high quality of whistling, and today we are very happy to have、uh, one of the most famous, not only in Alsace but also in France and in the world, and the world, <laughs> the world. of a whistling producer, uh, uh, Sinton Bash, and、uh, we're very honored to have the owner、uh, of the the domain,、uh, Olivier, on the other side of the camera. So he's an expert in viticulture, wine making, bio dynamics, and also in theory because he's、mm. the first master, master of wine, wine in the whole France. So welcome, welcome, joining us.、Uh, thank you for taking your time to join us. Hello, Olivia. How are you? Welcome, Hello, Graham. Hello, Amy. <laughs> nice to be with you. A long time no see. So、um, as we explain, it's always the biggest honor to work with Olivier because he's an expert of different、uh, aspects. So maybe more, many our, of our customer didn't pay a lot of、uh, effort or time to understand Elsass. So basically, the language you can see the Chihuahua because、uh, Elsass historically also it was a、uh, sometimes. It was belong to Germany. Yeah, and、so, okay. In the in the Alsace is located in the border of、uh, France Germany and Germany. France. So yes,、yeah, so you can see from the name of the terroir is sometimes it's German, sometimes it's French. French. <laughs> so but it's not easy for us、mm. to understand. But today we have the expert to、mm. explain the characteristics of the Alsace. So, so、uh, Olivia, we have been tasting different whistlings from different countries.、Yeah. <laughs> so can you introduce us a、uh, the French whistling from Alsace? So、uh, Alsace is the only region in France where Riesling is actually planted. We are along the the Rhine River,、um, as you know. And you mentioned Alsace changed nationality a few times. Actually, before Louis the Fourteenth, you know, the the king's son, Alsace was part of the Austrian Austro-Hungarian Empire, and eventually it was attached to the French Kingdom. And after that, there were many many fights through history. And it is true that. We have what I would call a, a Rhine River Valley wine culture, divided both between France and Germany. So a lot of our names do have、um, a, a vineyard and villages that sounds、uh, German. But actually, I would call them more Alsatian because we have our own local、uh, dialect, which is slightly different from uh, 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 German. And Alsace is a very long, narrow strip of vineyard. Uh, you can see uh, uh, on the map is about、uh, 150 kilometers long. You see the Rhine River on the right side, and on the left side you have the the Vosges、uh, mountain. 16,000 hectares, and the Riesling grape variety, which is used to make still wine, because you know、uh, we also produce、uh, sparkling wines in Alsace and this kind of product.、Uh, Riesling represents、um, roughly a quarter, 30 percent of the dry. Uh, style of wines made in the region. On our estate, 
uh, Riesling represents between 40 to 50% of the wine that we produce uh, in quantity. It's by far the most important uh, uh, grape. It's also a very traditional grape variety uh, in the region, absolutely. Yeah. So the Domaine d'Indombrecht, we the family goes back to the, uh, the beginning of the uh, 17th century. I am the 12th generation to make wine uh, among the Humbrecht. Uh, my son is today uh, in charge of uh, more the, the viticulture production and cellar uh, part. He joined the winery uh, uh, two years ago, uh, Pierre Mill. My father, Leonard, is uh, still around, but obviously yeah. he's not uh, retired. The domain in Humbrecht, as we know it today, uh, was created in 1959 when my uh, father, Leonard Umrecht, married Genevieve Zind, and they put together two small uh, family estates and uh, called the domain from then on, Domain Zind Umrecht. So the oldest Domain Zind Umrecht wine that we have in the cellar is from 1959 when my father started uh, uh, to work. We are today located, uh, the cellars are located in Turkheim. Uh, which is just west of uh, Colmar. We are in the middle of the, the Herrenweg um, uh, vineyard, where actually the wine Roche Roulet is uh, made from that we are going to taste uh, uh, later on. But uh, my father, myself, and even my son today, we are what I would call a vineyard collector. So we, we like to go in many different places in Alsace to produce wine because Alsace, unlike many other regions in France, is extremely complex in its climate and geology. Uh, we, we had through the, 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 the history uh, many different uh, uh, geological uh, big uh, movements that created fault lines and volcanisms and all these kind of things. So in Alsace, you can basically find almost all the major salt types that exist uh, around the world. From, from granite, volcanic schistus, from very old rocks to modern and old limestones and more recent gravelly soils, silt and sand and all this, you can find this everywhere in Alsace. Alsace also has a very intricate climate. Most people don't realize that Colmar is the driest town in France because we are protected by the Vosges Mountains, which are on our west, these Vosges Mountains creates, yeah, that's a good picture. The Vosges Mountain creates a, a shelter for the, the, the Aldas uh, region. So on the other side of the mountain, it really rains a lot. But on the eastern side of the mountains, uh, where all the vineyards are located on the foothills of these mountains, it's actually very, very dry. And it's also not only dry, but it's also a continental climate which means that you have extreme variations in temperature. Uh, it can be cold in winter, it can be really hot in summer, it can be cold during the night and very warm during the day. Last year, for example, uh, uh, it was quite amazing because in the middle of the harvest, in the morning, it was only eight degrees Celsius. So it was really very cold, you needed a warm coat. And in the afternoon, it was 35 degrees Celsius. So there was a an amplitude of 25 degrees Celsius between day and night. This has a very interesting effect because it prolongates the ripening season. The grapes take longer to ripen, which is good to build up aromatics in the wines. That's why Alsace grows a lot of aromatic grapes like Riesling, but also, you know, like Muscat, Gewürztraminer, and this kind of grape or Silvana. And also it keeps the acidity uh, interesting into the wine. When the nights are cold, the vines burn less acidity during the ripening season. That's why, and for a grape like Riesling, you really need a good acidity, although it's not what I would call a good uh, Riesling. And if you ask me why is Alsace a good wine area to grow Riesling, I think these two reasons are uh, very, very important. Our geology, they can give different style of taste in the wines, but also the climate that allows these wines to become very, very uh, uh, interesting. Yeah. I think it's also very unique uh, compared to other region who produce uh, Riesling. Mm. So like Alsace, although it's like a more northeastern part of France, a uh, lot too far away from Champagne, but uh, you got a unique um, terra that 
you have long sunshine, as uh, Vicky mentioned, and very dry climate to make it, uh, very, make it the, the grapes can ripe successfully and keep the aromatics. And also, mm. it's a very hilly area. So as Olivia mentioned, you mm. have a lot of microclimate and some yeah. aspect. Because once, I mean, uh, mm. I visit, actually, I mean, it, when I could travel, mm. I visit Olivia once every year because there's so many things you must learn mm. in, in Elsa. So I understand that, uh, also understand that the vineyard classification also in Elsa. Is it like similar yes. to the Burgundy one, or, or how, how do you how we, does it work? We are, we are going towards a very very similar Burgundy classification, not quite exactly the same, but it's true. Uh, today you have um, one AOC Alsace, where you can find all the major grape varieties, including Riesling. You have a category called Cremant, which is sparkling wine, and within the AUC Alsace, which is the blue triangle on the bottom. You have the Alsace AUC, which is the three wines that we're going to taste uh, later on, a part of this classification. Mm -hmm. Then you have a uh, village classification, Cru Communal. You have single vineyard and you have Premier Cru. The Premier Cru oh, are today under classification. So I cannot tell you uh, which single vineyard will eventually become uh, uh, a Premier Cru. It's still under the, the hand of the INAO, uh, you know, uh, commissions. Uh, and it probably will take another, quite a few more years to be uh, finalized. It's, it's a major important work, which is complicated, as you can imagine, you know. <laughs> Everybody wants primary crew, but the INAO doesn't want to give it to everyone. Yeah, primary crew. So this is his decision, the it's already confirmed. So it's, it's confirmed for the decision yes, of the, adding the, the, crew, It you know? will happen. We don't know mm -hmm. when because the, there are different experts and commission uh, working on, on this. And it's a lengthy, lengthy process because there are many, many single vineyards in, uh, in Alsace. And potentially, probably not as much as in Burgundy, because in Burgundy, you know, there are many premier crews. But in Alsace, probably there will be, I don't know, between 40, 100, 50, 100. It's, it's something which is difficult to, to say uh, uh, today. On the top of the pyramid, you have the Grand Cru classification, which exists. There are today 51 Grand Cru vineyards uh, in Alsace, um, ranging on different kinds of soil types. But all these top vineyards are always located on hillsides uh, that enjoy uh, uh, you know, very good climate, very good exposition. Some can be really, really steep. And uh, these are the, the top of the range of the Aldas wines, where really the soil signature is very uh, important. The production of Grand Cru Alsace in, in the region represents roughly four or 5% of the wine sold in, uh, in, uh, in the region, just to give you an idea of uh, comparison, yeah. It's so on the domain we own today, we own today five different Grand Cru. Uh, going from uh, the north to the south, Sommerberg, Brand, Hengst, Goldet, and the Rangen in Tan, which is the further uh, in the south. Yeah. I just like to say, with the Riesling in Alsace, generally speaking, um, you know that the, the, the major country producing Riesling today in the world is still Germany, and by far. Um, but there is, uh, and, and you can see in Germany, there is a very strong uh, a trend to go towards drier style of Riesling, yeah. especially amongst what they call the GG, Grosse Grivax uh, style of um, uh, wines. In Alsace, I would think it's the opposite. The traditional Rieslings are usually dry, dry, dry by European standard. That means for Riesling uh, below nine grams of um, uh, sugar. Um, and it's the sweet wines which are exceptions. And those sweet wines in Rieslings are rare and rare um, for different reasons, uh, the demand of the market, but also the, the change in the climate. You know, the climate is changing around the world. Alsace is getting warmer. The harvest is slightly earlier. So the production of sweet wines, botrytis wines is becoming even rarer now than it was in the past. But today in Alsace, you can say with great confidence that uh, 99% of the Rieslings are dry wines. 
uh, 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 today. Yeah. With the climate change, is it easier to do the Hondong Tarif, the late harvest? It's becoming more and more complicated. We used to make a lot of Hondong Tarif in the 90s, in the, in the early 2000s. I just remind um, uh, the people who listen that the classification of late harvest, Vendange Tardive Selection de Grenoble, was only officially done in Alsace in 1983. Um, and the, the 80s, 90s, uh, and up to about 2010, 15, it was easy to produce late harvest wines because we had uh, classic vintages. But more recently, when the vintages are earlier and drier, it's more and more difficult to get botrytis early of quality and also keep the acidity in the wine if you have to wait too late to harvest, you see. Uh, when in the past, the von Ostadiv were done in October, November, it was cold. So you, you keep the acidity in the grape. Okay. Today, when the ripeness happens in September, like it was the past five, six years, it's difficult to keep the acidity if you wait later to, to harvest. So personally, today, it's still easy to get the ripeness to qualify for von Tardive, but it's more difficult to keep the acidity for these wines. So personally, I don't like to produce them uh, nowadays in this kind of uh, vintage. Okay. Mm -hmm. So before we go into the, to the wines, I, I would like to ask that um, about biodynamics. So okay. in the first place, um, why do you choose biodynamics? And how do you think that it affects the, the, the vineyards or finally the style of the wines? Well, um, the, the, the real story, the, the different things. The, uh, the, the first is, um, it was easy in the 80s to see that um, the progress of modern viticulture, current what we call conventional viticulture, which is the use of you know chemicals in the vineyard and pesticides and herbicides and things like that, created problems. We were not solving the problems. Usually, when you go to a doctor and you're sick, the doctor cures you, and if he's a good doctor, you don't need to go back to this doctor, okay? Because you cured. With conventional viticulture. Every year we had to go back to the doctor and take more and more powerful medication because the old one wasn't working anymore. So we're, we're going to hit a wall. And it's a situation which was not, for me, sustainable in the future, having every year to go more and more powerful with, with uh, chemicals and all this. We also realized that we were losing biodiversity, we were losing insects in the vineyard, we were losing natural predators. We were, the soils became harder and harder, more and more compacted. We were also losing worms and microbiology in the soil and fermentation became more difficult and, and we would see more and more deficiencies in the vineyard. So something had to be done. We had to find a viticulture which was sustainable for the future, and which enabled the soil to stay fertile and alive. So obviously, organic cultivation was a strong direction to go to. Regarding biodynamics, we were starting to make comp our own compost, because in compost, you bring good quality fertilizer to the vineyard, but you also bring life. You bring microorganisms, you bring worms, you bring you know, uh, mushrooms, you bring uh, bacteria and all this. And um, doing all this, we realized that to make a good compost, we had to buy organic manure. And one day that compost was so fantastic. I talked to the producer to buy every year his uh, uh, manure. And he told me, ah, before you took the manure, I sprayed some 500 on it, so you would have a better compost. And I, at the time, it was the early 90s, I was talking with other wine producers in France that also were converting into biodynamic farming. So and knew what preparation 500 was. That's what we call the, 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 the horn compost, you know, uh, the, the cow horn uh, compost. And I said, ah, so you are a biodynamist. And I, and I was curious and I said, okay, you compost, you manure made my better compost I ever had. So let's try to understand what's happening. Let's dynamize our compost like biodynamists are doing, which I did the following year. 
And I compared the organic compost with the biodynamic compost. And in the biodynamic compost, I had much more microorganisms, much more worms that I could see. So I thought, ah, it's working. It's make a better compost. So I learned and I, we, we worked with uh, Francois Bouffel, who was uh, one of the early biodynamists in, uh, in France, who also created the association uh, Biodivin in uh, 95. And he, he went to the estate and we worked for three years together. So we could do experiment into the vineyards starting uh, in uh, 96. And we really liked the result. So eventually we converted the entire estate to biodynamics in uh, uh, 98 and joined the, the Biodivin Association uh, in 1998. And since then, we could see fantastic results in the vineyard. The soils are more alive. We see much more worms. Uh, we have no more deficiencies in the vineyard. A lot of uh, uh, pre uh, uh, predators are naturally controlled by natural auxiliaries. You know, the bad guy is eaten by the good guy, if you want. So we, we don't have to spray against them. We have better fermentation, more yeast, and what, something which is absolutely fantastic, I didn't expect at all. Fermentation, are even better, and because uh, we've got more natural yeast um, in the vineyard. And we also see, and you can see this in the three wines you have behind you, we get better acidity today than we had 30 years ago. And that is something which goes against logic, because in the logic of global warming, we should have less acidity today. You know, when you get a warmer climate, you get less acidity. But when I look at my analysis, we have more acidity in our wines today than in the past. And I only can explain this by the fact that the vines perform better. They are more efficient. They are more alert. They, 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 they do the job better. And, and that's basically what we try to do in biodynamic. We bring, we bring preparations. We bring herbal uh, extracts. We follow a specific calendar. We create an environment around the vineyard that allows the vineyard to work better and be more uh, uh, efficient. You know? So how about the, the Renaissance day? Appellation, do you also uh, join other associations to align with the people and promote biodynamic not only in Alsace, in France, and in the whole world for the so, Renaissance day? We, we haven't done much in Asia recently because, you know, traveling is complicated. <laughs> yeah, it's like for you. Yeah. But, uh, we, it's not easy to, to, to no. practice. Uh, no. But I hope, I hope we can travel again normally uh, in the future. But in, um, uh, we are doing end of November, for example, uh, a huge presentation of wines with 104 wine growth from, uh, in biodynamics in the BOD Association in Paris uh, at the 29th of November. We will do London uh, next year. And the Renaissance group, Renaissance is an international group of um, biodynamic wine grower. It was created in the early 2000s, it's about 20 years ago, the first tasting. We were only 20 wine growers. Today we are over 300, I think, from all, the whole world uh, is there. And it's true, we do travel uh, to different countries in France, Europe, Americas, Asia, and all this. We were in Hong Kong. I forgot the year, but it's about five or six years ago, something like that, to do uh, yeah. a small presentation. I was there. Uh, <laughs> taste the wine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, started to 80 years now. I think, yeah, yeah. Six, six, seven, something yeah, like that. The six, first six. and the only uh, Renaissance day after the tasting in Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah. So of course, at yeah. that moment, only they came to Hong Kong as well. Mm. Absolutely. So that's <laughs> the wine. So we have a very special, very special light up today. Uh, so we have three wines today. They are from the uh, same producer, of course, uh, same vintage, but uh, it named differently. Very similar label. Can you show it on the uh -huh. camera? Show it on the camera. Okay, this is the first one. So like. Few wines, very similar labels in different color, though. Um, I, to my understanding, is a different soil type, but the same yeah. variety, right? Yeah. The the line in the middle symbolizes the hillsides of Alsace, and the color of the wow. bottom part of the label symbolizes the color of the soil. So limestone is oh. more yellow. Limestone is more yellow. Granite is more pinkish in color. 
and uh, the roche coulee is a more gray uh, color because it, it's a it's a kind of a granite uh, pebble uh, stone uh, that we have. No, that's just to explain the difference between the labels. Uh, that's all. <laughs> so, holy so, means stone, right? In French, holy yeah, so, means stone. Okay. This series of wine, we created it uh, a few years ago because we thought it would be interesting for people to learn about the terroir without going to a too complicated concept like single vineyard or Grand Cru. In these three wines, you can compare three Rieslings from the same vintage, uh, harvested uh, in the same condition, vinified the same way in the cellar, bottled almost the same day, uh, a year and a half after a harvest. And the, the entire process is very, very similar. And when you look at the analysis of the wine, it's also quite, quite similar. Uh, the alcohol is very uh, similar. The acidity is very the similar, around seven good. grams per liter. They're all three dry. Maybe the Roche Coulee is the driest compared to the Roche Granitique, but they're all considered as a, a dry. And the pH is all within the same range. So if you taste the difference between these three wines, it's not the climate, it's not the vintage, it's not the vinification, it's not the, the, um, uh, the, the harvest time or, or, or something like that. It really is the signature of where the wine has come from. And uh, uh, roche means rocks. And rocks. then we, call, we have uh, the first one is the roche granitique. I think that you are uh, tasting. That's granite. The second one will be roche coulee. Roche coulee is a bit of a play of word because in English it means rolling stones. It's actually pebbles are granitic rocks which are rolled down into large pebbles, which look like you no know, really big potatoes, if you want, mixed with very fine oh, okay. sand and silt. So like just, just not the pop. So like those stones, similar? Uh, we call yeah, it like, like, like round the uh, galet. It's like in Chateauneuf du Pape, if you want, yeah. Oh, yeah. Type of stone. We, we have some stone from Bordeaux de Tupou Caillot. The shape is perfect. I know the yeah, shape is like this. Yeah. Yeah. There's something like so this. This is more like yeah. Waffle soil. It's a kind of stone you will find in the, the Roche Coulee wines. Some smaller and some can be really, really much bigger because uh, the, the, the valley floor in Alsace is very close to the mountain. So those rocks didn't roll down a long distance, so they, they are less eroded. And some of those stones can be really uh, the size of a suitcase, you know, can be really, really uh, 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 big. And, and calcare means calcareous or limestone. And in okay. Alsace, there are many, many different uh, uh, limestones, but this one is mostly the oolitic type, which comes from the village of uh, uh, Gebershreer. That's what composed uh, uh, 90% of this wine. So the 19 vintage, um, 19, 19, 2019 was a very good vintage in Alsace. It's what I would call an almost easy vintage because we had no frost, we had no, no uh, disease, important disease pressure. The weather was very warm in July and early August. So the ripeness was actually quite fast. Uh, the, the vine were growing quite fast at that moment. And then from the middle of August to the end of the harvest, the weather became much uh, cooler, quieter, uh, less warm with some rainfalls that were useful. And the vines kept very good acidity in 2019. Uh, so it, it was a, a medium sized harvest also, uh, not big, not small. So really a, a very classic uh, uh, vintage. A vintage which is also interesting to, to where the wines show a lot of uh, vineyard character, you see. So it's interesting to compare these three wines, especially in this vintage. Here you have our harvest process. Sure, sorry, I don't know if you want to right. want it to show. Um, come in, come in, come in. Yeah. <laughs> so th this is in fact Gewürztraminer in a grape you have on, on the picture. It's not Riesling. Uh, don't get confused. Uh, these pink, uh, nice pink uh, 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 grapes are Gewürztraminer. 
Riesling is a totally uh, a classic white uh, grape. And the picture on the right is one of our vineyards called the Hangen in Tan, which is a very, very steep uh, volcanic uh, uh, hillside. Yeah. So the vinification process by us is very, very simple. Uh, the grapes are harvested by hand and brought to the winery in small containers, which are directly put into our pneumatic press. We do whole cluster pressing, so we don't crush the grapes, we don't distem the grapes, and we press for a very long time, uh, 12, 15, 18 hours, very gently, very slowly, with very little press movement in order to extract uh, interesting components from the skins. That's our pressing room and our cellar. And the juice is all done by gravity, the feeding of the press and the juice running down. And you can see on the picture on the right, the juice is running down from the press above by gravity in the settling tanks on the bottom. These settling tanks are in stainless steel. The, 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 the must or the juice stays in these tanks overnight where we control the temperature and the next morning, the juice is racked into our fermenting casks. Uh, uh, we call them food in, in Alsace. That's Ooh. one example. And uh, this food range in size between uh, eight, 900 liters for the small ones up to 10,000 for the really, really uh, uh, big one. Once the-, Is it the a very old barrel? Sorry? Is it a very old barrel? So this cask you see in front of you dates from 1993 because it's a cask that we had made for the, the birth of my son, Pierre Emile. And so this cask is today uh, 28 years old. <laughs> you can, uh, uh, the, the stone on the cask symbolizes the Pierre, the stone. It's an all different symbolic uh, on the cask, which I will not go into it, much. It, it, the Taurus means, the yeah, the, 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 the the, the door is closed by a bar, and this bar is sculptured into uh, uh, a torus, uh, uh, a bull, because uh, my son was born in April under the, uh, the sign of the bull in France. You know, uh, it's a little bit different in Chinese, I know, but we also have <laughs> our own, uh, you know. <laughs> that is culture every five years. Oh, yeah. Can you choose your symbol or you must follow to, to some regulation or the tradition? For example, if I want to make my fruit... What is your <laughs> animal? <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> true. No, I mean, for example, just uh, when I visited the winery, I even saw the fruits that to uh, celebrate the marriage of Olivia. Oh, okay. Yeah, wow. so of course it's very decorated. Yeah. So if I want to make one, so is there any historical or I can just pay and to choose the symbol I like? No, no, the, the people's sign is depends on uh, the position of the moon in front of a constellation, just like the dynamic calendar. And it depends, it's on your date of birth. So I was born the 1st of March, 1st of March is Pisces, which is a water sign. Uh, uh, oh, okay. It's, it's the horoscope. Yes. It's, it's, like, it's like a horoscope if you want. Yeah. yeah. Horoscope, yeah. In, in biodynamic, we use a calendar and one, the, the different movement that we, we look at, the movement of the moon yeah. the, the, and different things. But we also, what is very important, we look at the position of the moon in front of which constellation it is in the sky. And this yeah. constellation have a, a specific sign, for example, water, air, fire, uh, earth, okay. and the, the, some specific constellations are more favorable to different kind of um, uh, um, uh, plants. So the, the vine is a fruit plant. Yeah, that's a calendar. The vine is a, a fruit plant because we produce fruits. Like it's yeah. No, 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 I mean, like, as he said, so Olivia is a uh, is it the, fall, uh, the first of March or April? No, 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 no. So you have to look, no, no. You, you, you would have to look the calendar of 1963 not too, I mean, wasn't oh, wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> so oh, I only have like 2014 and 2015. You have to buy it every year, every, every winter. Oh, yes, yes. I have to buy it every year, but now it's very 
very difficult to. I like like Tom said, something in yeah, yeah, yeah. Chinese culture. I don't you, think you can start actually with, with only yeah. it's too. <laughs> but you could look at today. If you have the the twenty one calendar, you could look today to see where in front of which constellation the moon is positioned. Oh. And that will tell you whether you are uh, uh, in a fruit day or not. And many of the important work we do in the vineyard, everything that touches life, uh, it's better to do it during a fruit day. And that is really depending on which constellation uh, the, the moon is in front. And the, the, the three constellation, uh, which are the fire symbol, that symbolizes the fruit. It's uh, the Sagittarius, uh, uh, the lion, and the one. I don't know the, the name in, the, <laughs> in English. Yes, yes. You have the three areas, Leo, and also Sagittarius. Yeah, I know that in 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 the Chinese culture you have uh, five elements. Uh, uh, in in Bayami we have uh, uh, only four. But probably the, the our fire element is can re represent maybe two of your elements, you know. Okay. I so that's why today I know why you, you need to you need to drink, uh, for example, a ginger tea after you eat some crab, because crab is cold and ginger is hot. Not the temperature. It's not it's about it. Yeah. Yeah. So in in biodynamic, we do almost the same thing. It's a question of bringing balance. Uh, uh, into the vineyard, yeah, and the vineyard is. And we also need the wine as well, so so you balance different flavor or component of a bottle of wine, the acidity or or, or the residual mm -hmm. sugar or the fruitiness of the wine. So it's all about the balance. If you bring a good wine, yeah. that is more technical. That is more technical. Um, but usually, when you do a good work in the vineyard, you don't have to change something on the great in the cellar. You just let it happen. You know. If you have a problem in the vineyard, you have it's a already balanced in the vineyard. And then, and then you have to correct the balance because you have either too much alcohol or not enough acidity or something like that. And then you start to, to play the analogist. But if your grapes are perfectly balanced, like I hope to have most of the years, we just let the juice ferment. The fermentation of these three reasoning lasts about a year. When the fermentation um, uh, is finished, the wine becomes clear, stays another uh, six months in the cask to be bottled. Um, uh, these three were bottled uh, this year, earlier in uh, in February. So it's very, very simple. But what I wanted to say is the vine is a water plant. The the planet that the, the, the vine depends of Mercury, the planet, which is a water planet. And so the vines is lacking fire element. So everything we do in biodynamic to balance the vine is to bring the vine fire element. That's why we use a lot of plants in the vineyard uh, that have a very strong fire uh, element uh, signature. Yeah, just to, I, I wouldn't say that to many, many uh, Zoom tastings, but I know that uh, uh, in your culture, you understand this a little bit better than maybe uh, in other parts of the world. <laughs> That's why I'm, I'm saying that, yeah. It's very interesting because in the Chinese feng shui, actually wine is also fire element. It's not yeah. liquid, it's not water, it's fire. Oh, it's I didn't know that. Yes, 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 you know, I am. Uh -huh. So should we taste the fire now? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> because wine is fire, but the vine is water. The plant yes. is water. Yeah. Yeah. This, oh, is, okay. this is fire. The wine but is fire. But the, 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 the wine that you drink is fire especially if it's well made, but the, the, the vine, the plant, <laughs> that is water. Yes. Uh, anyway, so which wine are you starting with? The, anyway, so, the I have the so I just want to tell the audience that uh, uh, before the live, we opened up three bottles at the same time and tasted side by side. And although it's the same producer, same, same, same grapes and same vintage, yes. it tastes totally different Indeed. just because of the soil. So, uh, um, so this is my favorite, the Calgary, the limestone okay. soil. I really like the acidity, very sharp, and also the minerality behind it. So should mm. we start this first? Yeah, okay. If it's your favorite. You <laughs> yeah, of course. So, um, so like, like, Olivia, I have a question again. Like, uh, if, if one of, if some of our audience have the same BYs in front of them, can you like just briefly um, 
one one sentence talk about what's the difference in terms of style of these three wines so they can they can choose where, where yeah. to open so uh limestone is cold the soil so you expect oh. the wine to be tighter very mineral very yeah. slow to develop oh, mineral. With, uh, usually a broad palate and a and a very tight acidity it's also a wine that can age extremely well uh, maybe of the three wines it's a wine that would keep the longest and i'm sure the 19 calcare riesling could age very very easily 15 20 25 years with absolutely no problem uh, the the riesling roche coulee this one comes from the valley floor with this big pebble stone that you showed before this is a very warm uh, soil very precocious that shows in the wine you have that generosity the the, the roche uh, uh, roulet is uh, very uh, generous very forward uh, it doesn't hide anything and you have everything the first day to be able to taste in the wine it's also perhaps the wine which is the most riesling in style if you know i mean if you want to learn what riesling really is in terms of aromatic in terms of style what a dry riesling is this is the wine you should begin with because it has absolutely all the characteristics of a great Riesling grape, uh, a certain aromatic, it's forward, great acidity, it's bone dry. Uh, and it's a wine really showing a lot uh, uh, today, a certain power, a certain generosity. The Roche Granitique as granite. This wine actually comes from a Grand Cru vineyard called Brandt. It's what we would call the second wine. You know, we use the old vines to make the Grand Cru and the younger vines, which are uh, below 30 years old, are used to make uh, this wine. And so here you have a very, very good, of the three wine, it's a Roche Granitique that has maybe the most prestigious uh, soil origin. You know, it's a Grand Cru vineyard. The very warm brand, Inhalation like comes wine. from brandic. Brandic means hot and fiery. And uh, uh, you get that in the wine. You have a, 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 a luscious richness. You can see of the three wine, that's the wine that is really, really uh, superbly aromatic, very forward. It has a, a really rich uh, palate, but also a very, very good acidity. Of the three wine, it's actually the wine that has the highest acidity, but hidden. Mm -hmm behind a very generous and very um, um, uh, uh, aromatic more, profile. More yeah. forward, more foot forward, more fruit in, in, in a granitic. Yeah. Uh, uh, on this, to me, it's more complex. You have different more elements on it. Rather than, it, like only I mentioned, Poulet is more direct, it's more like typical textbook, classic one. I would oh. say, you can find more interesting elements in the question. Yeah. The signature of the granitic soil is always to make beautifully aromatic wines from the beginning to the end. You know, some people say Riesling becomes petroly with aging. Uh, it's a word I don't really like to use too much because oh, okay. uh, there's a different way to understand it. Uh, some Riesling, when they ages, when they age well, obviously, uh, get that very typical mineral, rich, intense, rocky uh, character, um, which people call petrol. And yeah. that's something you see more often on limestone soil. That's the direction that the Roche Calcaire will take with time. Mm -hmm. The other two wines will stay much more pure in, in their flavor, especially the granitic. The, the granite from the brand makes wine which are superbly, delicately aromatic, lots of floral expression, and it will stay like that through its time. And the more it will age, the more these beautiful aromatics will open up and expand and show even more. The granite and the calcare will age beautifully, but very differently. In, in two almost uh, opposite uh, uh, direction. Yeah. So, so, I so the, the, the petrol flavor of an aged riesling 
So it's actually from the soil. limestone soil. Mostly, yeah. But there are many, ah. many elements that can uh, uh, change that. You know, oh. reductions, sulfur, yeah, sure, sure. the way it's been yeah. vinified in stainless steel or not. The, 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 the quality of the ripeness, uh, if there is drought problems or not. Riesling is a grape variety which uh, does shows very quickly the vineyard problems. You know, uh, you you can hide problems in the vineyard in some grapes because they have a certain richness and they're very very intense, like Gewurztraminer, for example, in Alsace. But Riesling is a very delicate grape, so the slightest thing that happened in the vineyard or in the cellar will show very easily uh, after into the wine. You know, the Riesling doesn't, it doesn't hide uh, this very easily. If, if everything is good, if the vineyard is good, if the, if the work was well done, you make an absolutely fantastic wine. But if it's the opposite, the Riesling will be very poor and not interesting. It's, it, it is a great variety that shows what the wine grower is doing in the vineyard and in the cellar. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also reflect the, the terroir where they go. So I guess, like Burgundy white Chardonnay is very popular here in Hong Kong. So mm -hmm. Olivia, do you think like a Riesling um, is a, have a very similar ability to reflect the terroir uh, of the origin? I think even stronger than Chardonnay. Um, ah. Riesling uh, is a mirror of the terroir, much bigger mirror than the Chardonnay grape. That's why traditionally the vinification of Riesling stays simple and pure to, to yeah. allow the taster to find these differences uh, that can yeah. be very, very strong. Uh, so for example, oh. with Riesling, we don't use new oak, we don't use barrels, yeah. new oak, we don't do batonnage, we don't do these kind of things. You know, uh, it could alter the perception of the terroir. And also Riesling shows great success on almost every soil type we have in Alsace, whether it's granite, whether it's volcanic, whether it's slate, uh, different type of limestones, sandy soils. Riesling shows something very interesting in every uh, uh, soil type. That would not be the case with Chardonnay. Some soil types probably would not suit the grape uh, uh, Chardonnay, you see. Did you expand your Riesling plantation in your winery since you uh, get back to it and also because of uh, thanks for the biodynamics of the increase or the uh, improvement of your soil quality that you think you can find more Riesling in your vineyard? Absolutely. The different reasons uh, Riesling uh, uh, is increasing. It, it probably will represent 60, 70% of our production in 10 years, I would think, for different reasons. Um, um, it's not just public demand, but of course we have to adapt also to what people like to drink. And Riesling is a complex wine. It's not an obvious, easy wine to understand. You know, when you look at Gewurztraminer, Gewurztraminer is, a great wine. I am really fond of Gewurztraminer. But Gewurztraminer can also be a very easy wine to understand by the public. It's aromatic, it's fruity. You don't have to have much vineyard character to make it sometimes very interesting. You just need a great ripeness and a great aromatic expression. Yeah. Even though terroir on Gewurz can also be very, very good. But let's speak about Riesling. The more the people, the drinkers, become educated into drinking wine, the more they go towards more refined and more elegant style of wines and more complex style of wines. So you go maybe from a, a rich Côte du Rhône to a delicate Burgundy. You go from a rich expressive Gewurz to a more delicate terroir driven Riesling, you see? That's why Riesling, I guess, as the world population gets every year more and more uh, educated in wine, there's more and more demand for uh, this kind of uh, wine. And also people have learned to drink wine with food. And Riesling is probably one of the easiest wine to pair with a lot of different kinds of food. So hence- the, 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 Especially Asian food. Yeah, yeah. 
And, and lastly, global warming, I'll go back to that. Uh, some vineyards in the past in Alsace could not be planted with Riesling because the soil would be too cold and the ripeness would be difficult for uh, Riesling. I always remind people um, in the 60s, 70s, some years Riesling really was not ripe at all and it was very difficult to drink because the acidity was very, very, very hot and very high. Today, this kind of vintage uh, 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 you know, when the flowering is like middle of July, it doesn't exist anymore. Flowering is usually between end of May and end of June. So you have the time to ripen Riesling properly. So it means that some vineyard in the past where we, I would not think planting Riesling because it'd be too cold. Today is perfect. And I give you a very good example, the Hanks Grand Cru. Hanks Grand Cru makes fantastic Gewürztraminer. And that's what was the main grape variety was in the past. Today, you can find in Hengst two new grapes that are really developing very uh, strongly, Riesling and Pinot Noir, red wine, you see? So, um, and that's only because uh, of the help of a slightly warmer climate that we have uh, uh, today. I'm not saying that global warming is a good thing, okay? We do everything uh, to, to you know, protect our environment, uh, uh, but in our case, having slightly warmer uh, uh, ripening condition means that today we can plant Riesling in vineyard where in the past we had to plant precocious grapes uh, uh, variety. Yeah. Do you think you, you are moving to also some warmer uh, grape variety? Like as you mentioned, I don't know, you also start planting some Pinot Noir in, in the vineyard as an experiment because I always want to buy the Pinot Noir from you, but I have been requested for over five years already. Okay, I need to come back. Prince of Pinot Noir. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, I mean, it's tiny, it's difficult. Mm. And will you expand the production because of the global warming effect? Um, it's a very good question. We, we, we do make an extremely small quantity of Pinot Noir. And the, the bad news is that we didn't produce any in 2021 because the vineyard was hit by frost very badly. So there'd be no red wine in 21. And in 2020, the production was also half for almost a similar uh, reasons. Um, for the moment, we are not expanding our red uh, vineyard uh, because all the vineyards were um, we could plant it. We can also plant Riesling into it. And me personally, if I have to choose in others between a, a great dry Riesling or a great red wine, I still prefer to choose the Riesling grape, uh, which is my son maybe in the future because he, he trained in Burgundy, he loves red wines also, uh, Pinot Noir great, you know, and uh, maybe we'll plant more uh, uh, Pinot Noir uh, uh, in the future. But I still believe when it comes to Alsace, in dry Riesling, Alsace can really be at the top. We are at the top of the dry Riesling in the world. With some other regions also, but we are equal, you see. When it comes to red wine, can we be equal to the better vineyard of Burgundy? with Pinot Noir? That is my question. Some people say yes, it's a, there is a potential to, to, to do it. Um, I am still a little bit uh, uh, not 100% convinced. I, I love some of the red wines made in Alsace, but Pinot Noir is a grape that is also very complicated. It requires also from the people who make it a certain culture of red wine that most people in Alsace still don't have. We, we are born into white wine barriques. White wine, know, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, barrels, you see? And yeah. that, that is an important thing. It's like if you ask a French person to do good Chinese cuisine, <laughs> if do something good, they will not do the best. You see what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you make dim sum. <laughs> <laughs> so like, yeah. a Thanks again uh, for for Olivia for joining us today. Like last question uh, uh, before I let you go. So like uh, I uh, I always ask them um, like, each producer. So do you enjoy whistling outside of us? Like uh, in, if so, which region you you see your like a to go whistling? 
Haha, <laughs> very good question. Because uh, no, no, in, in obviously uh, the other two major countries that you cannot avoid yeah. is, is uh, Austria, the north part of Austria, especially Austria. Uh, uh, along the Varao and all that. They make fantastic Rieslings and also Germany. I mean, uh, 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 whether dry or whether sweet, uh, it, their wines can be also absolutely fantastic today. I'm not going to uh, uh, number them all to you. And then also sometimes in the new world, you can get some really, really interesting uh, little spot of interesting uh, uh, wines, you know, like, I mean, the first time I visited Clare Valley uh, uh, was back in 1989. Uh, I actually just after visiting Hong Kong, I went from 89 to, to Hong Kong to uh, Australia. And uh, you can also taste some very interesting wines uh, over there. I mean, you import some wines from 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 uh, uh, Grosset also. So I've tried them also quite a bit. Next week, next week we'll have Jeffrey Grosset. <laughs> oh, okay, in the, in, in the in the yeah, tasting, great. Week. Say hello to him. <laughs> yeah, and and you may you know you may not know, but uh, for now four years I'm, I'm uh, working with an estate in the Okanagan Valley in Canada, and we're also uh, making some very very good rieslings over there. Yeah. On some volcanic soils, actually, yeah, it, it's a great variety. Which, like I said, it 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 can adapt very easily. Uh, so. Yeah, it's not as specific as, for example, Pinot Noir or something like that. You know, or Cabernet Sauvignon or something like that. It can really adapt, and it's a question is to find the right climate to the right geology, so it can ripen slowly and not too fast, and also In the right the climate. <laughs> yeah, because Riesling is a very fertile grape. Riesling is fertile and it can produce a lot of grapes. And if it produces too much grapes, you make diluted wine. So you need a good wine grower who controls all this naturally to, to, to keep the production small, to get taste into the wine. I'm very happy with, with this sort of thing. <laughs> So, uh, okay, uh, thanks so much for, thanks again for joining us and uh, taking your time. So what's the time uh, in, in your place? It's the afternoon. Have you had a lunch yet? It's 12 o'clock here in Scotland. Uh, okay. No, no, so we, I, we lunch in an hour or so. Yeah, yeah, no, no lunch yet. No, no, <laughs> no lunch but, uh, yet. But I'll let you have the lunch. And, and it's a very good conversation now. Oh, with, 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 with the master so of, of Whistling. First to visit Olivier yeah. every year. <laughs> and I think I, everyone should visit Alsace. It's a beautiful, 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 beautiful place yes. in France. Yes. And Coma, not only the driest area, but also it was chosen as 100 best 100 most you beautiful. You must visit. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Coma, very, Coma. I love beautiful. Coma. I get a friend chosen. living there. And it's so beautiful. It's a very lovely place. Good food, good people, yeah. and not and bad. good wines. Indeed, indeed, indeed. <laughs> and if you want to visit Alsace, you should especially come in. 2023 because we're celebrating the 70 years of our uh, wine road in Alsace and there'll be a lot of uh, events uh, especially between May and August uh, tasting, yeah, yeah. celebration, wine fairs and things like that every single weekend yeah Ah, nice. We Thanks are invited, yeah. we can come. I, I, I'm, I'm going to buy my ticket right now <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you Oliver Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Yeah. Cheers. Have a good afternoon. Have a good day. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you for enjoying Bye. the wine. <laughs> bye bye.